Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can see and hear me all right. Welcome to Crew Seattle's June 2020 Luncheon on Historic Preservation and Adaptive Reuse, New Uses for Timeless Classics. I know there are a few folks who are still joining us. We have a lot to cover today with our fantastic panel, so I would like to get started. I am Ashley Sherwood. I am a, uh, the 2020 Crew Seattle president and proud to say a partner with the law firm of Oles Morrison, Rinker and Baker. Before I get started today, um, I want to give a big thank you to our sponsors. A big thanks to our 2020 platinum sponsor, Oles Morrison, Rinker and Baker. To our gold sponsors, Bentall Green Oak, B and Builders, DPR Construction, Goodman Real Estate, Mortensen, Sellen, Skanska, Stokes Lawrence, Vulcan, and Unico. And a thank you as well to our 2020 silver sponsors, whose names and logos are on the screen in front of you. And finally, thank you to our in-kind sponsors. By pledging their support of Crew Seattle, our sponsors really are walking the walk when it comes to supporting women in our industry. And without them, we wouldn't be able to put on the great programming like the panel we're going to bring you today. A few announcements for you. Uh, on June 1st, Crew Network announced its Pay It Forward campaign, which invites crew members to donate to Crew Network Foundation to thank, support, and honor other crew members who may be experiencing difficulties during this time. This contribution not only supports women in crews uh, research into equity in real estate, but it also helps the chapter achieve its 50%, its goal of 50% member donations, as the donations will be credited to the person whose name in which you're donating. More information can be found on the Crew Network website or you can email foundation at crewseattle.org. We have a number of upcoming virtual events. June 13th is a UCRU event in which the Foundation Committee is partnering with Seattle University to present a panel on land use controls and affordable housing protection. Board of Director Liaison for the Foundation Committee, Jean Marie Coronado uh, with CBRE, will be moderating the panel. And I understand there were some issues earlier this week uh, with registering for that event. So those should be resolved by now. So if you had any issues before, please try registering again. It's going to be a fantastic panel. June 16th, we have another virtual and very timely panel on the intersection between race and real estate. Mark Washington from East Still Secured will moderate the panel and our panelists will be Andy Adams from uh, SVP with Store Development and Design at Starbucks, Ken McIntyre, CEO of the Real Estate Executive Council, and Raquel Timmons from Seco Development. June 16th is our kickoff meeting for Crew Seattle's first running club. The club is going to virtually train together for Seattle Marathon's uh, 5K or 10K virtual race, which will take place on Saturday, August 22nd. I will not be joining the runners, but rest assured, I will be cheering you on the whole way. Uh, June 18th is our Coffee and Conversation, which is hosted by Carrie Gartside Anthony from First American Title and Marlene Myers from J.P. Morgan Chase. And last but not least, August, uh, excuse me, June 26th is the deadline to submit board nominations for anyone that you think would be a good candidate to serve on the organization's board of directors and self nominations are fantastic as well. You can register for all of these events and find more information about other upcoming events on our website, cruiseattle.org. And please uh, be sure to connect with us virtually on our social media platforms. We try to be mindful about not overloading your inboxes with too many emails each week. So social media is really where we try to provide the most up-to-date information on everything we have going on for that week, um, including sponsor company highlights and moderator and speaker bios. 
Now, we are all very familiar with the world of Zoom at this point, but a few housekeeping items uh, that I'd like to go over. First, the presentation is being recorded and will be distributed after the presentation. Um, all participants are automatically muted and your video and chat functions are turned off. This is to help the presentation go smoothly and also to help you direct your questions uh, to the Q&A function, which is open for all of our participants. And it will be open throughout the presentation, so please, please, please submit questions via the Q&A function in uh, your Zoom. Questions will be asked at the end of the presentation. And if you notice in the Q&A section, there's a little thumbs up button. That's a way to upvote questions that you like. Um, if someone else asks a question and you really want to make sure that that gets asked, you can upvote it by, by clicking the thumbs up. And uh, the last item is during our Q&A session, if you can select speaker view, that will help um, kind of focus your, your screen on the individuals that are speaking. And as I said in my email, sending the Zoom link, if you don't know where speaker view is, that's okay. You'll be able to view the entire Q&A panel. With that, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Melissa Teichman. Melissa has spent the last 16 years in the design and construction industry and received most of her training as a general contractor. Though mainly focusing on health and healing environments, Melissa has also experienced the thrill of adaptive reuse, corporate commercial, and tribal projects. Melissa most recently completed the Big Fish, uh, Big Fish Games corporate headquarters in the historic Maritime Building which received the 2019 NAOP Office Interior of the Year. I myself have uh, been able to visit those headquarters and they are beautiful, I am jealous. Uh, presently an owner's rep at OAC Services, Melissa is responsible for internal and external growth in the healthcare practice group. Melissa is engaged in organizations like ILFI, WSSHE, Women Leaders in Construction, Building Women, NAWIC, and of course, group. Melissa is also a mother to, to twin eight-year-old female change makers. All right, that is plenty of talking from me. I am going to hand it over to Melissa, who is now going to introduce our fantastic panel for today. All right, thank you so much, Ashley. And I do have a fabulous panel to introduce today. We're gonna kick things off with Marie Turnus. Marie is a structural project engineer at Coughlin Porter Lundin. And from adaptive reuse projects in the PNW <clears throat> to high rises in New York, Marie has long been interested in projects that enhance and transform the urban experience. Drawing from a portfolio ranging from urban office and higher ed to healthcare and seismic retrofits, she leverages her experience with a variety of building materials and design goals to develop inventive structural solutions. As lead structural project manager on the landmarked 100 plus year old state hotel, Marie worked to maintain the architectural integrity of the building while also making it a seismically resistant structure that's safe for the next generation. She takes pride that she worked to transform the previously neglected historic site into a lively part of Seattle's future. We also have with us today Pamela Trevithick, Pamela is a principal at LMN Architects. She's known for her collaboration and management leadership. Pamela has spent her career successfully delivering private and public developments, including commercial, workplace, hospitality, and residential projects in the PNW. A creative and strategic thinker, she leverages her unmatched capacity to engage both project stakeholders and community voice towards a unified vision resulting in solutions that enrich neighborhoods and cities. Pamela was the project manager on the newly completed Asian Art Museum expansion and reno project, which was a $56 million project that honors and preserves the architectural legacy and the historic 1933 Art Deco building, as well as the integrity of the Olmsted Design Volunteer Park. And finally, Patrick Foley, Pat's the co-founder and principal at Lake Union Partners. Lake Union Partners is a Seattle-based development firm focusing on urban infill mixed-use projects. 
preservation and adaptive reuse projects in the Seattle, Portland, and Salt Lake City markets. His portfolio includes more than 20 adaptive reuse projects in the Seattle area, most notably the State Hotel and the Standard. Patrick focuses on project vision and the execution of, of developing the business plan. And with that, we're going to go ahead and start today with some presentations that our panelists have put together. And I believe that Patrick and Marie are going to kick things off for us today speaking about the State Hotel. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for that, Melissa. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, I have a short amount of time. Uh, Marie, I'm honored to be here with uh, my friend Marie Turnus, and I can also attest that she's a, a borderline genius and was as immensely talented, and the work that she did on the State Hotel for the structural engineering was um, beyond, uh, beyond challenging. It was very tough, and she did an incredible job. So um, with that, I want to get into the the, re, the redevelopment of this preservation project. My um, these are these are my favorite types of projects. They're they're the most uh, difficult for sure, but um, also the ones that I have the most love for. So um, I'd like to get right into it real quickly. The the history of the of the State Hotel. Um, these are just some quick images. This is uh, when the Seattle fire started in Pioneer Square. The view from where the State Hotel is now. You can see Second Avenue was a dirt road and some houses. Uh, this is across the street from the State Hotel, which is now a parking garage looking on Pike Street. It used to be houses and mud. Um, this is one of my favorite, Chief Seattle's daughter. She's sitting right here in front of where El Bistro is if you're walking down to the gum wall. And whenever I walk by, I, I try to uh, imagine her sitting there. And the State Hotel would have been about right here in the background. Here's the Starbucks. This is uh, the ITEL building when it was under construction as a medical dental building in the early 1900s. You can see Denny Hill came right down to Second Avenue. Uh, here it is, here's the ITEL building at the time, now State Hotel, and then Denny Hill as they were removing the Washington Hotel. Um, here, here's, uh, here's the building in the 20s uh, when Ben Paris was the original restaurant. We've renamed the current restaurant there, Ben Paris. Uh, this is a view looking uh, from the Pike Place Market. Here's the building right here when it was a medical dental building. You can see the Ben Paris sign. Uh, this is Ben himself, uh, just an interesting guy. We really brought his name back um, just to honor the history. Uh, this is one of my favorite images uh, after World War II, a big celebration out in front of the building. Here's our lobby entrance. So this is what the building looked like when we acquired it in 2015. It was really run down. It was uh, an open air drug market. On the street here, there was uh, scariaki, teriyaki, many of you probably remember that. Um, there was a nail salon, a smoke shop, a needle exchange, and then the upper floors really sat vacant. It was sort of a bombed out building uh, since the early 1970s. And so um, uh, when we came along, it had been through the several earthquakes, especially the Nisqually earthquake, and was um, had a lot of uh, damage to it. And so it was really, really challenging to, to figure out how do you rebuild this building from the inside out. Uh, this is another view of it with all the, build, the windows uh, boarded up. And then this is as we started the interior uh, structural demo, what we started to, to see, because there were walls in there where these little dental suites used to exist in the early 1900s through 1969. And during, uh, we've there was no room really to do anything here. Um, we had to figure out how do we set the job trailers for our contractor, Excel Pacific, um, structural uh, scaffolding. There was no room for a crane, so there were mobile crane lifts that took place, uh, material lift, and stairs on the exterior. And here's a view looking out, one of my favorite views, the old stairs on the inside looking out to the market. Uh, this is one of the things that I, I love being able to peel back the inside of a building and see that the original heavy timber came from the Lake Washington Mill. And here's an image that I found of it on in Seward Park, which is where the, the timber for the State Hotel was made. And then that's, I believe, Mercer Island when it was a, an old growth forest. Um, Marie, maybe you could talk a little bit about this. This is some after we peeled the building apart and started reshoring it up and getting it ready to rebuild. Yeah, um, one of the most complex parts of this project was that we uh, removed the existing roof and we added a whole another floor onto the building. 
Um, and so to do that, we had to essentially leave these brick walls unbraced. Um, and so we installed bracing up at the roof to keep them um, to keep them from falling. And they were heavily damaged during the Nisqually earthquake. Um, and so that was a, a critical piece of the design. Um, yeah, you can move forward. So this, this, uh, this is an image of a, a new concrete shear wall that we were putting up against these brick walls to help brace them. Um, and, and all the rebar had to fish all the way up through the building. Um, and then we used shotcrete to create these shear walls on the exterior. Um, and this is another image of uh, the extent of the demo. So not only did we remove the roof, we also took out the, um, the entire West Bay, which is what you're seeing here, and rebuilt it all the way back to the property line on the right. Um, this was to regain space for uh, shear, shear cores, elevators, and um, some new stairs, which didn't exist before. Can I just say something about this? This is one yeah, of my course. favorites. So the, if you look here, these steel columns that were original, um, what we learned after we started peeling the paint back is that these were all, they had these Carnegie steel stamps. And so it's really cool. All those columns are still in the building today. And to know that those came from Carnegie steel is, is really cool. And here's what in the corridors today, when you go up to the state hotel, you can use those, those steel columns are out in the corridors. Go ahead, Marie. Yeah, and, and so here, this is a photo. We're standing in the basement of the State Hotel looking up at Second Avenue, um, and the whole first floor has been demoed out. Um, you can see those Carnegie steel cast iron columns on the left side. Um, this was a, we had to rebuild this floor at a different elevation, um, but those cast iron columns are really tricky because you can't weld to them. So we had to use um, the existing connections that were actually cast into the columns and make custom details at all these uh, column locations. Um, one of the big successes of the project, really. And yeah, here is, uh, you can see how we rebuilt, um, we rebuilt that floor to the property line on the lower right image uh, with light gauge metal framing that with, because we didn't have access to cranes very often. So everything had to basically be, be placed by hand with a, a couple of construction work, workers lifting every element. Um, and we had to also uh, provide new, new foundations for the shear wall elements and the brace frame elements in, in pretty confined spaces in the basement. So I'll say here, this is a, an image on the left when we took the, on the project, this is really kind of what the street looked like. Um, uh, we used to see junkies sitting, I'd go into the building, there'd be junkies sitting here shooting up as we were going into the gates and they just sort of look at you with indifference and really sad, you know, to see that, but it's really fun to see it. This is what it looks like today. Um, here's the Ben Paris space in the, if you've all been there, what it looked like during construction. And then here's what it looks like today. We're happy to say it, it turned out really well. Um, just real quickly, I'll get into the, um, the attitude of the hotel was really kind of a, a we, br we brought um, just the thinking that we wanted to bring the, the art um, uh, as it relates to counterculture to, to the, the state hotel is really more of an independent attitude. And these are some some images and people that we like. This is a lot of art that's in the building. This is an art piece by Shepard Ferry on the West Wall. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and then here's Shepard Ferry himself. I'll talk about a little bit about how we met him, but he's he's behind the Obama the Hope poster from 2008. Uh, Chuck D, one of my favorites. These are some street kids that used to hang out in the 80s that we've come to know. Actually, this this woman here, she's a friend of ours today. Artist the Spoon Man from the market. Uh, these are street kids are we have some art in the building to honor the history of the street kids who used to hang out here in the 80s and this is our friend Erin Blackwell today back then she was standing across the street where Target is right now and then here she this is her daughter who we've come to know as an artist there are two art pieces in the building that she, we had her do of her mother when she was 13 and then this is Erin today with her children who they came back as a guest at the state hotel. And this is Justin. He's a young guy. He's so great that they all survived. He wrote a book called Street Child, and this is images of him on the right. Uh, Shepard Ferry, uh, we were able to contact him in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, we were really interested in his, his art. And so we, uh, we were able to get him to, to come up to Seattle and, and install this piece, and we really worked hard with him on this. It's a message about uh, climate change. I think is really important, especially with the, the view out to the Puget Sound and um, but here's that west wall that was rebuilt. And this is another friend of ours, uh, Taki Award, an artist that we're working with on some of our central district projects. She did this cool piece called Enjoy up on the roof patio. 
Uh, another artist, he's a tattooer, this guy Kyler Martz. We really wanted him to do a tattoo and we had him do a tattoo on the wall in Ben Paris. And so here's what it looks like now, which is pretty cool. Uh, another artist, Kate Blairstone, she did these custom wallpaper pieces. She's from Portland. Um, and then these portraits, that's Mike Anderson. He was an astronaut from Spokane who died in the space shuttle. <clears throat> some, other art, some other art pieces that, that she did in the guest rooms and then the lobby wallpaper. And then the transformation, really, the interior. Here's the current lobby today. Um, we really uh, pride the, ourselves that this is a community gathering space. We, we uh, love it when we, we show up and there our friends are there meeting people or just doing work or whatever. Here's the bar, Ben Paris. Uh, this is this cool knob wall. Um, we are, some of these knobs came from inside the building. Our interior designer, Rachel Suwea from Vita, she designed this actually. And um, these are knobs from all over Portland and Seattle and within the building. Here's another view of that wall inside the lobby. It's our friend, uh, she's our all-star uh, uh, bar manager, Abigail Gullo. You have to go in there and meet her. She's, she's amazing. These are what the guest rooms turned out to look like. There's those arched windows that I love so much. The guest bathrooms. Uh, we built a roof patio. We added one floor to this building. We worked closely with the preservation board to allow that. And here's the view look from their area looking out to the sound. And then here's the, the street now. You know, we're, we take a lot of pride in, in, in changing the street and making it a, a nice place to be. Another view look from like over at Target, looking over to, the, uh, to Ben Paris at the corner. Uh, another great view inside. And then this really cool canopy designed by Weinstein AU, our architect who uh, did an amazing job on this project. And then here it is today. And we were, I feel really, we normally don't really like awards or kind of roll our eyes at awards, but this one we are really proud of with, this is our, um, Marie's not in this one, I don't think she could come that night, but there's her colleague, Brian Zegers, and uh, some of our team members who came to win, to uh, accept this award for preservation project of the year. And then here's the building today, and I think I have like a few more seconds, so I'm gonna play this short 60 second um, uh, video we had done of Shepherd Ferry talking about fire sale. I don't know if you can hear it. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we can hear it. Can you hear it? No? Okay. Well, anyway, I'll just kind of let it play through real quick. It's really, uh, it's really pretty cool. Okay. Whoops. All right. Thank you so much, Patrick and Marie. That was fantastic. Next, we're going to move over to Pamela, who's going to give a presentation on the Asian Art Museum. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I think you all know where this is located, but it's up in uh, Volunteer Park on Capitol Hill. There's a, a long history to the site and how that uh, was envisioned, and I won't talk too much about that. But originally, the design was uh, prepared by the Olmsted Olmsted brothers, and at that time, it did not include um, locating a museum. And when Dr. Phil Fuller and his mother commissioned a local architect by the name of Carl Gould to design a museum in the early 1930s, um, the Olmsted brothers were adamantly opposed to locating a museum on their, their site or their, in, within their design. So those uh, ties were severed and then a local landscape architect by the name of Noble Foster Hogson was hired to continue with the site and the landscape design. So the, the Asian Art or the Seattle Art Museum uh, was the first U.S. Uh, museum built in the United States in the Art Deco style. And then upon completion of the museum itself, um, Dr. Fuller dedicated it to um, the city of Seattle. And then it was, it became the Seattle 
art museum in his first location until it moved downtown to um, in the 1980s. And due to the growing Asian art collection, it, um, this remained obviously and, and houses the Asian art collection. The city um, owns this, uh, the site as well as the building and then the, the museum actually has a long-term lease on the museum itself. Uh, both the park and the building are um, local uh, designated landmarks and um, on both, uh, both are also in the National Registry. And from the onset of this project, um, it was a really close collaboration of multiple stakeholders. And that included obviously Seattle Art Museum and their various uh, user groups, um, Seattle uh, Parks and Rec, uh, neighboring communities, uh, Friends of Seattle Olmstead, Volunteers Park Trust, and then of course the Landmarks Preservation Board. And from the onset, um, there was, uh, you know, we had pretty clear our, our overarching project goals. And those included um, connecting and engaging users to the east side of the park uh, to better serve the community with enhanced education program space, increased gallery space to show more art, and improve the building system and systems and infrastructure. And you can kind of see on this slide um, a series of historical photos, um, which are really, really cool. Um, pretty much um, the, you know, the west facade is pretty much in a, intact from its initial um, inception. But over the years, there was um, additions and things added on um, over the years. And then if you look to this um, slide here, you can see that the, the original east facade, um, very beautiful symmetrical arched windows um, were pretty much, um, the, the, east, the symmetry was, um, removed with the additions over, over the years. And it, clearly it lost its connection to the, the east side of the park. And then I added this just as a, a, a fifth goal, project goal. And that was um, given the, the site and that it's protected, um, protecting the significant trees and enhancing and restoring the, the landscape around the building was um, another really important uh, goal. And as part of the original um, you know, conceptual design of how to fit this uh, very um, clear program from the client within the site, you can tell with this diagram to the bottom right that we had some pretty significant restraints on where that could go. So um, after lots of study, um, this is more or less where the billable area and was, and this is where the expansion eventually um, came to life. Uh, the project scope itself um, consisted of a major renovation to the existing building and then a modest expansion to the north and to the east. The renovation scope included a complete overhaul to um, the infrastructure systems, sizing the construction upgrades, as well as bringing the building up to some level of accessibility compliance. Um, the east expansion um, really consisted of a three-story footprint that added more gallery space, an event and education space, and then administrative offices on the lower level. And then I, I'd like to point out that th this expansion really allowed the museum to incorporate a conservation studio. And this is really, um, it's a really important function to um, preserving Asian art. So this space is devoted entirely to the conservation, mounting and study of Asian paintings. And then through a grant program, this, this space was realized and, the only, and it's the only one in the US that specializes in Asian art or actually the Western US specialized in Asian art. And then the North expansion was a new loading dock and, and freight elevator. The um, expansion itself was more or less straightforward, um, but the, the renovation piece is where um, there was a lot of, of challenges um, as with any uh, preservation um, historical renovation. So lots of technical challenges um, that, that started with, you know, the building was constructed without exterior insulation. So um, there was some major issues with condensation and moisture. So you can see this um, lower middle um, photo where art is removed from the wall and you can see the condensation 
on the actual wall. So you can imagine how that doesn't really work with protecting art. Uh, many of the walls were unreinforced hollow clay tiles, so they were not structurally sound. And it, it's, it's quite interesting to think about some of the earthquakes we've experienced in our area that these walls had not crumbled previously because they're not braced um, and they're not full, they're just hollow. Um, the infrastructure, the systems all were dated. They had not been touched since really the 1930s other than sort of an a band-aid form. And I think the upper right hand corner really shows the condition of what those systems and control panels look like. Uh, no fire protection system. And then clearly um, in terms of the, the, its use, this building was pretty much on its last leg in terms of being a viable uh, space for it to contain art because it was a very um, strict sort of uh, environmental parameters and they weren't able to really continue um, inviting and um, awarding ex exhibits because they didn't meet the criteria. So that was really important to the viability of this, this building continuing to be a, a museum. And then the next series of slides are really just some before and afters that um, showcase the, the overarching project goals. So this is the final east um, facade. Um, up on the uh, left hand corner, that's what the original facade looked like before the run of or the expansion. And you can see, you know, us really wanting to connect the, the park to the museum and vice versa. Vice versa, I think that was really successful. On the west facade, um, there was really just sort of upkeep, up, um, keep and cleaning of the facade, but um, the, uh, the, the glazing and the, the ornamental metalwork that you see here, there was a um, film applied to the glass, um, which, you know, users would come up to the building and they weren't sure if it was open or not, other than having signs out there. Um, so part of the renovation included um, replacing that glazing and removing the film. And so you really can see the impact um, that had in this next slide uh, where there's just sort of a really great connection to the outside compared to what was on the left, which is shown on the left. And clearly, you know, the film was likely added um, for UV rays. And so it, it really remains to be seen if, if any additional mitigation needs to happen with the, uh, with the, new, uh, the, with the new glazing. Um, and then internally, um, I think that the, the biggest um, historical space that you see a, a difference in is really the garden court. So this is a space that you enter up from the lobby and um, these new portals um, punch through to the park lobby. And so that's really um, sort of a great connection that you immediately get when you enter the building. Sorry, these are really slow. Some more photos, gallery space. This is what we call the park lobby. Um, it's cantilevers over the, the east facade and it really feels like you're in a tree house. So it's a really great um, space to just contemplate and, and look out to the park. Oh no, I hope it hasn't frozen. So this is a view of the new gallery space and one of my favorite art pieces by, the, by Doho. I'm almost done. <laughs> Another view. So we started construction, I think, uh, around 2017. And this was a recent uh, drone photo of the completed project. Um, there was some significant um, site improvements as well that were made. 
And, you know, we, we launched the grand opening in uh, February of this year and then immediately closed a month later due to COVID, unfortunately. And then it certainly, you know, it took a village to um, do this project, you know, beyond just a stakeholder group. And so wanted to recognize and acknowledge our partners on this project as well. And that's, that's it. That was lovely. Thank you, Pamela. And thank you, Marie and Pat. Both of your presentations were just such an incredible nod to the history of our city and our state. And I think that that you and your team should be so, so proud of the, the structures and the projects that you've built to just make our communities even better. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and move into a question and answer period. Um, we have some prepared questions. And then hopefully after that, we have time for a little bit of audience uh, participation. So first off, um, let's, let's just chat about the Landmarks mm -hmm. Preservation Board because why wouldn't we do that in a, in a talk like this? Um, if you all could describe kind of one big aha moment for you during the process, you know, something you didn't think about going into it or challenges that you overcame during the Landmarks process and, um, mm -hmm. Pat or Marie, if you want to kick us off, and then uh, Pamela can respond after that. Sure. Yeah. In the landmarks process, I, the, the landmarks preservation board was so great with us on this project. They were really truly uh, collaborators, and uh, I just appreciate so much everything that they did um, to help uh, help us with the preservation of the building. It, it certainly helps when you're going in to meet with the board that you're going in with preservation in mind, not demolition. <laughs> so. Uh, the, the conversations are certainly a lot easier when you're you were in, when your intentions are uh, about preservation. And so, um, I will say it wasn't really uh, it wasn't terribly challenging because uh, because of that. Um, and then really the what we were getting approval for was to add the penthouse, the top, the eighth floor to the building. And um, we we really didn't have many challenges with that because we were set back enough. Um, so that it really wasn't visible from lower on the street. Um, the main focus, I think, by the board was the rebuild of the storefront because the those storefronts that were there when we uh, took the building over it were so had been changed out so much over the 115 years. They weren't even remotely anything that they were. So, um, so we were able to go through and rebuild those storefronts, but uh, we preserved the original columns that were there, those steel columns on the exterior, but they were very ornate. And, uh, and then uh, we were allowed to, to build in new storefronts and then that canopy that comes out over the front was another, they really were focused on uh, making sure that that was contemporary, that it wasn't like fake history. And so um, we, I, I won't say if we had that, I don't know that there was an aha moment. It was just, it was really, um, it was just a really well run process and they were great to work with. Marie, do you have anything you'd add to that? Um, yeah, I don't think it was a surprise necessarily, but one of the things that we had to do um, was that the state hotel is a non-conforming high rise. So um, it's a tall building. It's about 110 feet, um, but it's made of heavy timber. Um, but anything we added to the building had to be non-combustible. Um, so that was just one of the trickier parts about building a high rise um, that's non-conforming. And, and making sure that our systems that we were adding were compatible seismically with the systems that were already there. That makes sense. Thank you, guys. Pamela, how about for you? Any aha moments or? Um... Yeah, I have two um, quick points, and I echo what Patrick said about working with Landmarks. Um, they were really great team players, and I think because of them, it really helped us um, realize the, the overall vision for the project. And we weren't about demolition, we were about expansion, so that obviously um, is something they, um, they have to weigh in on and, and, and prove. Um, I think the first point um, was there was really strong, there was a very strong opposition to the expansion and the taking of the park um, was really problematic for um, the various stakeholders and rightly so because it's protected. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of, um, of vocality um, to um, the land boards or landmarks. And so I think um, with that, um, they really had to kind of think hard and probably cross their T's and dot their I's a little bit harder um, just to make sure, you know, they're trying to take in all this feedback. And so trying to sift through really what the, the goal of the project and what they're allowed to 
to accept um, um, was, was challenging for them, but they, in the end, did a great job. Um, so I think just the, the opposition, um, you know, very small, um, you know, small group had a very loud voice, but it was really impactful. And then the second piece of that, um, I think in, internally, the biggest architectural move we made, what or we proposed was um, having those portals punch through a protected space into the park lobby. And, you know, we studied and analyzed um, proportions and, and sizes and all that, um, but they were struggling with, um, I mean, that was because that was the biggest sort of architectural move, that was the biggest hurdle for us. And you know, there was a moment um, there that we weren't sure that they were gonna um, approve it. Um, we looked at um, other options in terms of how to connect uh, and, and flow. Um, you know, there's a certain flow of how you, you work your way through a gallery. And it would have had probably bigger impacts on other historical design. Um, and so in the end, you know, they obviously approved it, but that was the biggest hurdle um, for us. Nice. Thank you guys for sharing that. And so it sounds to me like if there's anyone on the Landmarks board on the phone that everyone loved working with you. It was a fantastic experience. So thumbs up to the project teams. Um, our next question. So let's shift to the construction side of things for a minute. So um, thinking about it from a design and engineering perspective. How did we have to align design on your projects to meet the needs of construction needs and methods? What kind of challenges arose there? Yeah, um, at the state, one of the hardest things was that it was such a small site and it was confined on all four sides by either buildings or roadways um, and limited access to cranes. So everything had to fit, um, had to be able to be manipulated in a really small space. Um, and we didn't really have an inch to spare. And, and with the, the nature of existing buildings is uh, things can be an inch or two off and, and you don't know until you start building it. Um, so we had a, a lot of oversight uh, and we were on site at least once a week um, during construction to make things, make sure things were fitting together right. If I remember correctly, Marie, you were there at one point every day, it seemed like for a while. <laughs> I was there, there were a lot. <laughs> just these, these field issues that would come up when the contractor was having a challenge and, and Marie would come down and help them figure out how to make something work. And it was, yeah, like it's kind of ironic that that was a dental building and the tolerances were like dental tolerances for <laughs> construction and engineering. Everything was so tight. And um, yeah, and I think another challenge too was um, at the time we had a, our neighboring building didn't really want us to do this project um, for various reasons. And so we had to figure out how are we going to do all of this work, rework of this building with nothing, like, like Marie said, no place to lay down any, anything. And so um, how are we build it from the inside without getting access to the neighboring building's roof or anything like that? So that was, it was immensely challenging, but um, fun at the end of the day, it was great that it worked out. Yeah, I would add, um, Marie brings a good point. I hadn't thought about that, but we had some major um, site constraints with getting a crane to lift those um, precast panels on the, on the east side. You know, we had critical root zones that we had to, to not disturb. And so that from a um, logistics from a contractor side was really challenging for them. Um, you know, we, you know, a lot of the interior um, gallery spaces were completely gutted and a lot, and those galleries had um, very intricate profiles, cove detail, corn, you know, cornice, um, base trim. And so all of that, um, some of it was had to be recreated. And so just in terms of um, how to uh, um, recreate that, that look like it had been there for, you know, hundred or many, many years um, was, I mean, I guess it's par for the course for these types of projects, but it was really important to get those dimensions and those profiles exact. So by the use of a point cloud survey, um, we were able to, to model that and basically replicate that um, to look like it had been there for, for years. And then I think the other thing for us, um, you know, because it was a, a museum open up until it closed up until the day we basically started construction. Well, no, that's not true because they had to remove all the art, but there was limited access to doing any sort of due diligence or investigation into the building. And so, you know, we had some drawings um, that we could uh, refer to, but until you really got into 
um, you know, taking out walls and, and getting into the, the, the meat of the, the heart of the building, you know, you had, you found things that you didn't expect. And so you kind of have to adjust and work with the contractor for the best solution that worked with their means and methods. And I, I wouldn't say that it really compromised the design so much, but it certainly, um, we had to be really creative in how we made, we resolve those issues. Great. Thank you guys. Those are great examples and responses. Um, so let's shift to the financial side for a minute. And um, Patrick and Marie, if you guys could speak to something we chatted about whenever we first got together, we talked about, you know, pro formas, they don't allow for just unlimited budgets. Um, we can't just have an unlimited contingency and allowance bucket to, dr to draw from. How did you deal with that during pre-construction budgeting to anticipate the unknowns and really, you know, just make it, make it work, make this project a reality. Mm -hmm. Marie, do you want me to start or would you like yeah, to? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that, there's no easy answer to that question. And it's really anyone who's worked on adaptive reuse, um, especially this building that had been untouched for years and um, so many unknowns. And it's really just preparing, going in with a really healthy, contingency, not just a contingency when you start construction, but a design contingency. And the challenge with that is that if you have too much contingency, contingency, then the economics of your project start to, you know, decrease. <laughs> and so uh, you have to be very balanced about how you're budgeting and, and using money um, because it still has to make se economic sense. And uh, you just don't, we just don't have these unlimited budgets. So yeah, we live and die by our budgets. And, um, we just are really, we do a lot of investigation, a lot of research, spend a lot of time with the contractor and the architect and the engineer and everybody involved to make sure that we understand as much as we possibly can about the project. But, uh, and, but going into construction, even after all of that investigation, there's still so much that just um, can never foresee. And, uh, and then there's also challenges that, um, for example, the city would not allow us to do these mobile crane picks at times too. And that's very expensive to, cancel those crane picks and you lose schedule. And so um, it's, it's just being very, very careful and thoughtful upfront as much as you can. In pre-construction, I, I can't tell people enough how important that is, um, a really good comprehensive pre-construction process. Yeah, from a design perspective, um, we went on, we didn't have any existing drawings um, from the building. And so we did a lot of initial site visits to gain information. Um, but even with that information, we, we had to, you know, design and draw all of our plans and details with flexibility in them so that uh, we can adjust in the field as needed. Um, and when the situation in the field was very different from what we uh, might have thought, oftentimes we would try to at least use the same pieces that we, you know, were already fabricated, um, even if they were put together in a totally different way to achieve the same goal. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I imagine even the uh, documents that you guys did have, the Osbilts that you had, I know Pamela and I chatted, how accurate are they really? Um, so yeah, thank you guys for sharing that. Um, so let's shift to, let's see, we've got some options here. Um, Pamela, during one of our initial meetings, you noted how important communication is on a project. I think everyone would agree that it's supremely important. Um, what are your thoughts on constructive communication and what does that mean to you on a project, this one specifically? Yeah, there's probably a lot I could say to this. Um, I think um, what this means specific to this project um, was really more about communicating uh, about managing expectations and quality control on a publicly bid project. Um, that was probably the, the biggest um, uh, sort of uh, concern that we had to, to work through. Um, you know, BM Builders did a great job, but on a public bid project, you know, you get low bidder on all of your subs. And in and, and a project like this, where it really, it, it really warrants a level of um, craft um, because of the historic nature, um, you're not always... Um, fortunate to get the, um, the subs that you'd like to actually work on the project. Um, so I think, you know, things that we had to work through from a quality um, um, expectation had to come constructively uh, and working through um, those challenges because there's only so much time and money that you can allocate to extending those types of things out. 
Um, and then obviously working through just all of the unforeseen conditions that seem to come up every day, every week. And, you know, there's, again, a certain amount of money that the, cl the client has to spend that's raised by um, donations. Um, and no one wants to allocate their money to unforeseen conditions. And that's the stuff that you, you don't see in a project like this. So I think um, the communication aspect and, and having respect for every voice at the table and how you work through a resolution on things like that, um, it seemed to be something that we were pretty good at at the end of the project because it was really important to, to, um, to continue that and have respect and, and listen to every voice. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, so we are going to move into the audience Q&A now, and we have a question that came through a while back. Um, this one is for you, uh, Pat and Marie. Can, is there any place in the state hotel that you can actually see the Carnegie stamp on the steel? I, I, just, an I just answered that live. Um, oh, did you? But I'll, I'll repeat it in case anybody hasn't seen it. It's sadly, no, we can't because um, we saved all of those columns and they uh, needed to be covered with intumescent fireproof paint. So it's really a thick fireproof paint that's covering all of those columns. And so it's, it's, the stamps are covered up. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so we do have a few more minutes and um, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't address something that's top of mind and we're probably going to run out of time to chat about it with as much time as it really needs. But, um, you know, all of our businesses and lives have been impacted by COVID-19 and I'm just kind of curious to hear from each of you, if you can briefly, you know, how do you see the industry adapting um, and overcoming, you know, what we've, what we've gone through and how's it affected your business? Uh, Pamela, if there's anything you want to add first off and then we'll, uh, we'll get um, feedback from Pat and from Marie. Yeah, this um, certainly um, probably warrants a lot of time to talk through this and, and especially overlaying the social and political things that are going on in our city or in our country. Um, it's just a lot to process. And I think, you know, for, for LMN, um, we're learning every day and the delusion of information that's um, that's coming in constantly and trying to just sort of unpack it. And it, it, it is an, been an interesting um, sort of whirlwind over the last several weeks in, in, in terms of how we've adapted to working because the way we work is so collaborative and, you know, it's, it's very different way of working when you're doing it remotely because we're all working remotely right now. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of negative things um, that we could focus on, but I think there's a lot of positive out of it that will come. And, you know, I don't know that we have answers to it yet, but I don't think that we will, um, we can assume that we're going to ever return to how it, nor it was before. And maybe that's a good thing. Um, I think it just gives us all a chance to kind of pause, reflect, and, and, and really prioritize on what's really important. and, and when it comes to sort of scenario planning for re-entry into the office, um, you know, there's lots of, we don't know when that will happen. So we're kind of working through that. Um, you know, obviously we have to be flexible. Um, it's, it's shown that we can work remote and, and do our jobs. And I would, I'm not sure how other firms are, are responding and reacting to that. Um, you know, as I said, collaboration is so vital to how we work. Um, and then I think, one thing that I see as a potential downside is the oversight and sort of the mentoring that's really important to our younger staff um, is really hard to do that um, remotely. Um, you can't just walk by their desk and look over their shoulder at the computer and kind of have an impromptu conversation. And so I think our younger generations are, um, are will probably be affected um, most, right? Because it's so important to their professional growth. Um, and then, you know, just in terms of project types um, that we pursue and, and, you know, before COVID, you know, Elements um, men um, very engaged in the convention center world. And before COVID, it was at an all time high in terms of um, RFPs we were tracking for um, expansion, renovation um, and repositioning. And all of a sudden that's come to a screeching halt. So how do we position ourselves for um, other types of project um, typologies that we, you know, would work on. Um, convention centers are going to have a complete overhaul 
until um, we kind of work through this. Um, so there's a lot of information obviously being um, shared on how they're, they're handling um, canceling all conferences and, and whatnot. So I mean, I could go on and on. I'll give Patrick and Maria an opportunity, but I think we're just continuing to learn and process and it remains to be seen. Maria, do you want to talk about what CPL is up to? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I think on our end, um, I, I can really agree with what you said, Pamela, about the, um, the lack of uh, mentoring. I think, you know, working remote is one thing when you, when you know what you're doing and you kind of have your marching orders. But as we kind of move on in the new normal, um, making sure that new hires and younger staff have opportunities to grow um, that, that everyone else has in, in their career. So I think that's one of the bigger challenges. Um, we have started to very, very gently reopen our office, um, you know, working with all of the, the guidelines issued for professional services by uh, the state of Washington. Um, I, I think we've had probably five, five out of 100 people that went into the office this week, so pr pretty low, um, mm -hmm. and I think it'll stay that way for a while. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can say at Lake Union Partners, we're a 12-person 12, 12 firm. Um, and we are, I think, I think uh, we have 16 seats in here spots, so we can have max right now four, per, four people be here. So uh, right now there's, there's a few of us here, but for the most part, everyone has been, has handled working remotely, um, done a great job. I guess I, I worry that um, if, if we're not able to come back in full capacity at some point, that it's gonna start to destroy the culture of some of these firms. I know it is ours. And I, uh, we do not, we're going to do everything in our power to um, mitigate that. But I really think it can wreck the culture if you can't have human contact. I mean, this is great that we can use this platform to communicate, but I don't see it as a long-term permanent uh, way we do business. I can see it being playing a major role, for example, not needing to attend as many OAC meetings in person. Uh, I think that's fantastic. We do some traveling because we do work outside of the city. And so that's great that we don't have to hop on an airplane as much. But um, I, I definitely worry that it's, uh, it could really hurt the way um, a company is organized. And so, um, but I'm also optimistic that, there, that we're going to have a vaccine. And I do think we are going to return to normal. Normal in the sense that people will be working at the office again. I think there's going to be flexibility that's built in. That's my hunch. I've talked to a lot of my colleagues in the industry that, uh, counterparts who say that they're just going to inherently how allow for more flexibility and more remote working but I, I still think people are mostly going to be working together in person again yeah. yeah I would agree with with Patrick the cultural piece of, of how LMN is adjusting um, you know we're 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 providing forums for the entire staff and employees to sort of just talk about what all this means. And we're taking surveys to understand, you know, if they need to be in the office and, and just what they're thinking. So we're, we're listening to our staff and regurgitating it out. And it's, it's informing how we think about when and when we get back to the office. So that's, um, it's been really uh, important for the staff to be able to have a voice uh, in all of what's happening in the, the world right now. Thank you guys, those are fantastic responses. Of course, we don't have the answers, but it sounds like we're all doing everything that we can to um, actively listen and ask questions and respond to, um, you know, our work communities and our external communities and our families so that we can continue to be uh, productive and healthy. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to all of the panelists. You guys did an amazing job. We did go a few minutes over um, hopefully our recording did not stop at the uh, precise one o'clock mark, um, but I think that wraps everything up for today. And if we didn't get to any questions, if you guys could um, uh, send, I believe that Crew Seattle is going to reach out to us via email and we can respond back to you that way. So thank you again. I really appreciate it.